Feast TV is brought to you with the support from Missouri Wines, Ikea, Caldi's Coffee, Old Time Produce, and the Raphael Hotel. Cheers to the Bottoms Up episode. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. There is constant innovation and growth in the beverage industry, and there has never been a better time to get a drink in this region. Today, we're going to be exploring breweries and distilleries, and the very first stop is at Copper Run, which is about half an hour south of Springfield. They are making spirits using Ozark Mountain Water. fascinated the concept of distilling products here in the Ozarks with the lore of moonshining growing up I read the Foxfire books and really appreciated the work and effort that I imagined went into making whiskey in the woods the uh, the farmers right maybe they were growing grain or, or rye or, or corn um, they had those resources that they could then ferment and so uh, through fermentation, they could make beer or wine. So a lot of families, and mainly women, in the kitchen where they were cooking bread, uh, it wasn't too many additional steps to take the bread and turn it into whiskey. The small production in the kitchen was used for a lot of uh, preserves and medicine. So you'd go and, and harvest the plants that you knew were good for elements, uh, and then you would soak those plants in your homemade spirit to preserve them and to have that medicine that would last for years. Uh, so some of the early distilling was for medicinal reasons. Moonshine is the whiskey before it goes into the barrel. That's what we call moonshine. So back to the old timers, they worked really hard to produce this product. And when it comes out of the still, it's high proof. So it might be 60%, 70 80% alcohol. Uh, so it was a high proof spirit that just came out of the still and it was available for commerce. So in our classification of moonshine, it's just the whiskey before it is aged in our Missouri white oak barrels. Here at Copper Run, we sell a lot of young whiskey. So we've developed techniques that uh, allow our whiskeys to taste good at a very young age. And the way we treat our spirits, the types of wood that we use to age it, we can sell a, a one-week-old whiskey, we can sell a one-year-old whiskey, and we're working towards selling a three-year-old whiskey. We start with water, and the water is the most important aspect to making quality whiskey. And we're so fortunate here in the Ozarks to have perfect water for making whiskey. When you come to the Ozarks, you drive right through our limestone mountains. Uh, limestone water is not necessarily rare in the country, but iron-free limestone water is. If we had iron in our water, it would pretty much ruin it for making good whiskey. Dave Burley has been with us for a couple years now. Distilling takes a tremendous amount of, of uh, attention and, and focus, and Dave does a fantastic job of really paying attention. So it's been a great pleasure for me to teach Dave and, and share with him my knowledge, knowing that our production is in really good hands. So we're now downstairs and there is heat emanating from the still, which is gorgeous. This actual design was uh, Jim's design. It's 150 gallons and uh, we get approximately a barrel at a time. I think to some people, distilling is still something of a mystery. It's magic. So how does it actually work? 
So what we do is once the yeast has converted all the sugar into alcohol, we'll, uh, we'll be left with around 10% in our mash. We'll basically be removing all the alcohol from the solids. The alcohol we extract from that is around 1,200 pounds at about 60% alcohol. We heat it up using propane burners and once we get to 173 degrees in the pot, that is when the alcohol will start to evaporate. The highest proof alcohol coming out at the lower temperature and then as you get closer to the boiling point of water, then you'll have a, a much lower proof. As the alcohol evaporates, it'll go up through our cone and then come across and then go down the pipe and into the bottom of this reservoir right here. The, the first liquid that comes out is going to be around about 85% alcohol. So you're looking for percentage of alcohol? Yes. To tell you when to cut? Yes. So we'll have our 85% to 80% heads and then our hearts, everything from 80 to 70, and then our tails will be 70 to 65%. Our climate, the species of white oak, are world famous for making the best whiskey barrels. And so working with our barrel manufacturers, we have the ability to make candy. We develop notes of vanilla and caramel and butterscotch, uh, roasty toasty notes, toffee, uh, burnt marshmallow. We can order, almost like a menu, the type of sugars that we want to develop with our, our barrel manufacturing company. So what are we going to try first? So first we have our 80 proof moonshine. It is uh, distilled from corn and barley. I think a lot of folks might be a little bit wary of trying moonshine because they think it's going to be very strong and really hot, well, but this has a nice sweetness to it. Yes, so, I'm glad so. you like it. Next in line we have our small batch whiskey. This aged whiskey and the moonshine you tried are identical, they're the same product, except that one's been barrel aged. It's round, yep. where the moonshine has a bit of a sharpness to it. The time that the moonshine has spent in the barrel has kind of like rounded out all of its edges. Definitely. It yes. has like that vanilla character that you get from the char on the barrel. Yes. When we're finished with the aging process and we dump a barrel to bottle that whiskey, the empty barrel still has 20 pounds roughly of whiskey in it. So it's a great pleasure to work with some of the local breweries in the area who then will take our, our whiskey barrels and age their beer, the stouts and the porters and red ales. And then after that beer aging process, we can bring those barrels back to Copper Run and age some of our specialty spirits in those beer kissed barrels, if you will. With our barrel program, we work with individual clients who tell us exactly what they want us to make. And they can come here and be a part of that production. What we'll do is we'll uh, figure out our grain bill. They'll actually uh, be here for the mash in. Once we get the mash in done, uh, the customer will come a week later and they'll actually be part of making the cuts for their own whiskey. That's so so cool. they know it's unique and uh, they actually decide on the flavor. And, then, and they have a full barrel. Yes, we guarantee at least 265 bottles. And so what do you guys have on the horizon? What are some new things that you're playing with? We've taken some beer from Mothers and from White River and we distilled those and came out with a really good hoppy whiskey. So that's one thing that we're waiting for. And then uh, we'll have a rye as well uh, in the next year. Things are on the horizon. We're just gonna have to come back and have another drink. of the Ozarks to the streets of Kansas City. We're now here at Lifted Spirits where they specialize in vodka and gin. This all sort of started off as a hobby. Michael and I have been friends for a long time. About three and a half years ago, after a couple drinks, Michael came to me and said, I really want to open a distillery. I told him it was absolutely nuts and there was no way that was going to happen. And as a good friend, I was going to set out and do the research to, to show him why this was a terrible idea. I had to come back to him a couple days later and say, you know what, maybe it's not such a bad idea after all. The timing is right, there are so many 
different trends converging on this right now and you know it's something that we're really passionate about and wanted to be able to do together with our two families. There's so much excitement and energy about craft spirits right now. It's really following almost the exact same trajectory as the beer industry about 25 years ago. We picked the East Crossroads in Kansas City for a number of reasons. It's such an exciting and growing and upcoming part of the city. There's so much art and energy and excitement down here right now. It absolutely aligned with, with our passions, with our interests, and there's no other part of Kansas City that had the energy that, uh, that the Crossroads has right now. This is quite a setup. So this is a column still, combined with a pot still? Yes, so it's a, a hybrid fractioning still. We can run it like a pot still, we can uh, run it like a fractioning still. And because the columns are uh, mounted to the side, uh, it's bypassable. And so we can put the vapor through just this column and not use the condenser and have a lot of copper contact and make whiskeys or brandies. Uh, or if we're trying to make a neutral spirit, which is the base for our vodka, our gin, and our absinthe, we would change those valves at the very top, and then that forces the vapor down and up through each column, down and up, and so we end up with a lot of separation. And then if we're making a gin, uh, we utilize the gin basket here. So what do you enjoy about distilling itself, like the process of it. I love all of the variables, how changing one little thing uh, in the process can completely change a product. And it's just a lot of fun to be able to, at one stage, interpret what's coming off in the moment, and at another stage, be able to dig into research and make it all the same. What did you do before this? My degree's in theology. Oh, interesting. So I was a, I was a pastor. Okay. Uh, one of the things I really loved about my theology degree is that I learned how to learn. And so I learned how to research and how to find things out and utilize them. So I started with some New Zealand home distillation texts. Obviously, I was just reading it for theory. And uh, uh, some 19th century uh, French distillation manuals and some organic chem books and started practicing. That's great. And now, I mean, you really are creating a product that is bringing people together. You can look out through these doors right here and see the people who are enjoying the spirits that you've made. I mean, is that was that a very intentional design choice? I wasn't thinking just them coming back or me being able to look forward. I was just thinking exchange. So we want people to know that the stuff is accessible. When we decided to open a distillery, one of the things we were really excited about was kind of pulling back that veil and letting people come in and experience the spirits from the grain coming in the back door and see and smell and taste and really get an understanding of how our spirits are made. And then we wanted to create an environment in the tasting room where people could taste those spirits in cocktails that range from the simple, classic, traditional to some really new, interesting, exciting signature drinks that we've created. So I'm going to be making uh, the Wild East. It's a vodka cocktail, uh, definitely one of our most popular drinks here. Kansas City is such a uh, you know, barbecue place that I just figured a cocktail with smoke in it would absolutely make sense and fit in. So the very first thing in the cocktail is a jalapeno shrub, basically jalapeno syrup. It also has lime juice in it, a little bit of simple syrup as well to give it a little bit of sweetness. And then we put a full two ounces of vodka in it. just strain it in. You can kind of like see a lot of like that smoke like reacting with like the cold there so it ends up looking really fun. So that's the Wild East. When you were putting together your gin recipe, there are so many different styles of gin. Like what, what did you want the Lifted Spirits gin to be? We wanted our gin to be uh, someone that you could walk up to, be fast friends, and someone that you feel like you could just tell your whole story to right away. We wanted 
that kind of personal experience with the, uh, with the spirit. I've never heard anyone describe the creative process in trying to create a persona for the product, so... Me either. <laughs> that was... I'd never done that before, and I thought it was a fantastic idea. It helped a lot. Yeah, it's really, really interesting. So how did you take that and turn that into a recipe? So how many botanicals are in the Ten, um, which is a little higher than I wanted, but uh, than I initially was going for. But they, uh, they balance really well. They play well with each other. Our gin has uh, more juniper in it than all the other botanicals combined. So uh, main ingredients being uh, juniper and coriander, mm -hmm. which traditionally are the main ingredients okay. uh, in gin. And then um, the other examples that we have here, we have cardamom pods. We use the whole pod, not just the seed. And rose too, huh? Uh, uh, hibiscus. Oh, okay. Hibiscus, mm-hmm. And then we also include some things like chamomile and some florals, and then there's some uh, other botanicals like orris root being iris root, which they serve more of a purpose than just flavor. They actually stabilize the spirit. Those are so some of the botanicals we use. I think the growth of the spirits category can really be attributed to cocktail movement, and there's just so much that you can do with it. There's so much variety, so much interpretation. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of creativity there. Next up, we're heading to Illinois to visit a brewery that's all organic. Let's go. This is a huge production facility. There's a sign when you walk in the front door that says it's roughly 120 steps to the bar. It's very long and you get to see these beautiful tanks. It's a huge undertaking. We had been home brewing for several years and then we both started working at Urban Chestnut Brewing Company in St. Louis. And I started working um, there as a bartender and then ended up working as their general manager opening up the Grove location and as well as their Midtown location. So, you know, I got a little bit of experience opening up a really large brewery tasting room. So that was certainly helpful in undertaking what we've done. So how did you decide what you wanted to create with regard to like the experience. Not just the beers themselves, but when you right. walk in, I mean, it's a very distinct interior. And really, we just fell in love with the building and it all ended up kind of designing itself because we just really wanted to keep kind of the nostalgic feel of this old bakery that's been here since the late 1800s. It was Alton Baking and Catering Company, Knowles Bakery, and then Colonial Bakery. So we've really tried to keep that feeling alive in the place, obviously with the name, the Old Bakery Beer Company, the tap handles being old rolling pins and other different elements like that. And you do make your own tap handles. We started with getting antique rolling pins and making those. We had kind of exhausted our resources there and realized that we would just go ahead and start making them. Our assistant brewer um, is extremely handy, so we bought a lathe and he's been making them ever since. Well, I think it's about time we go and meet James and see how all this great beer is actually made. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> I got into brewing uh, because I was just a fan of craft beer. Yeah, I started brewing at home, uh, really simple little batches, tasted like crap, but I kind of got bit by the science of it and the process and everything. All of our beers are certified organic. We only brew with American grown and produced malts, uh, hops, and as much of the spices that we use in our beers as, as we possibly can. But in terms of like our, our overarching style, I try to make all of our beers uh, fairly mellow. And I think by that, I mean relatively low on bitterness for the style, and also just like very clean. Our biggest seller is our citrus wheat beer. It's a straight ahead American style wheat beer. We brew it with about 40% of the grist is raw wheat grown outside of Champaign, Illinois, so pretty local. That one's our, kind of our core, our main focus. Uh, our second core beer is our porter, and that is an English style uh, black ale, the kind of classic English style dark ale. We brew it with three different types of roasted malts, a whole lot of Munich malt, which is very malty, very nutty, but a little bit of kind of a woody, earthy, floral character. This is our second anniversary uh, Imperial Stout. We've got it aging in uh, some tawny port barrels from Mount Pleasant Winery out in Herman. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, the tawny port to me is almost just like a cloyingly sweet bourbon. The base beer is about 9% alcohol, fairly high in bitterness because we wanted to balance the sweetness of the port barrels. It's sweet, but it is bitter. It's yeah. really balanced. It's and a nice like dark chocolate character from the roast malts. Absolutely. Why did you go with being certified organic? Why was that important to you? We purchase organic when we buy food and things for our home. Um, you know, sustainability is extre extremely important to us. So that was just something that we knew that we wanted to do. That has branched out into other projects that we've taken on and the way that we run our restaurant. From composting and recycling, the vast majority of our waste, um, LED lighting, using um, green chemicals and things like that in our cleaning process. We kind of try to make sure that we take sustainability into account in every part of our process. The majority of the year we actually use spent grain fed beef for our burger. So we have a relationship with a local farmer. He comes and picks up all of our spent grain and he has a herd of cattle that is fed exclusively Old Bakery spent grain. And so we are really excited to kind of close that loop and, and serve that on our menu. That's awesome. Having a place like this to come and have a beer or a bite to eat, it changes the quality of life in a city. It's a really yeah. important part of, of growing and expanding just the experience of being in a town like Alton. Yeah, definitely. And there are a lot of great places to go in Alton, and we're really excited to be a part of it. We really try to be a place that the community can come together. We just try to welcome everyone with open arms and be a hub for the community. So when I was thinking about what I wanted to make for this episode, I thought, yes, I can work with some of Old Bakery's beer, but I wanted to challenge myself and play around with cooking with gin. And I settled on making gravlax. And if you've never made that before, it is a cured salmon. And it's going to have a salt and sugar dry brine. And I'm gonna sprinkle a little bit of Lifted Spirits gin on top. So I'm gonna get started. You're gonna be surprised at how easy this is. The very first thing I'm going to do is in a pan that will fit you know, the size of the salmon that you have, just lay a bed of dill fronds. Now I'm gonna go ahead and make that dry brine. And again, super, super easy. So I've got about a half a cup of salt to a quarter cup of sugar. To that, I'm gonna add some white pepper, good amount, coriander, and then a little bit of fennel. And I happen to have fresh fennel seeds on hand, so I'm gonna go ahead and grind them up in my mortar and pestle. All right, fresh fennel, smells amazing. All of these spices really are kind of to taste, but if you want exact measurements, just go to feastmagazine.com. We have all of the recipes there. I'm just stirring this up, and then I'm gonna to toss in some fresh lime zest. The citrus really wakes up the flavor of the brine and it goes really well with gin. So whenever you're cooking with gin, kind of think about all of the different flavors that are in the gin itself, all the botanicals, and that will help tell you what direction to go in with your ingredients. Toss this around. So with your salmon, before you cure it, you wanna make sure there aren't any pin bones, which are those little tiny bones inside of the fish. So just run your hands along the sides, and if you don't feel any, then you're good to go. So what I'm gonna do is lay this first flesh side down, and I'm gonna press my brine into the skin. Then I'm gonna flip it over, and then apply the rest of my brine. So with this type of a cure, you want the fish to rest for at least two days, preferably three. It's going to be much more firm if you give it three days. But remember, this is not a cure like smoking the fish. It is still raw fish, and so you'll want to eat it within a few days of cure. Now comes the gin. You don't want much. You just want to sprinkle a little bit on top. It's gonna add beautiful flavor and aroma and help the salmon cure beautifully. I'm just gonna lay some of the dill fronds on top, add some plastic wrap, and then it can go in the fridge. 
Now, of course, I mentioned this actually takes two, preferably three days. So I have a magic of television version that I made just a couple of days ago. So I'm gonna grab that. What the salt does is it pulls all the moisture out and you can see that the liquid kind of pools down here and the fish is incredibly firm. It smells fresh and clean. Oh, it's gonna be delicious. Typically you would serve very, very thin slices of gravlax with a dark brown bread, but it's also really good with bellinis, which are these tiny little pancakes that you often see served with caviar. So I'm gonna make some of those today and it's gonna start with just four eggs. So to the eggs, I'm gonna add a cup of sour cream. All right, half a cup of flour and then just a quarter teaspoon of baking soda and a little bit of salt. We're gonna cook these up just like pancakes. So I'm gonna head over to the stove. So here I have my beautiful little stack of bellinis. Sour cream or creme fraiche is the perfect accompaniment and then some really pungent and delicious microgreens. So now's the moment of truth. You need an extremely sharp knife. If you have a dull knife, this is not gonna work. You wanna make sure that it's sharp because you're cutting very, very thin slices of the salmon. And if you have a dull knife, it'll just rip the salmon apart. So what you wanna do is hold your knife at a 45 degree angle and then Slice it, get it as thin as you can. And I'm sure you're noticing that I am not cutting through to the skin. The skin is something that you wanna have during the curing process, but it's not really something that you wanna have attached to the piece when you're eating it. There we go. I think it's about time to dig in and I'm pairing our Gravlax with a Vidal Blanc from Balducci. And I chose a Vidal Blanc because it has a very minerally, almost stony flavor to it. And that's gonna pair really nicely with the kind of gin, juniper flavor that we have in the salmon as well as the salmon itself. Gravlax is an elegantly simple way to work with salmon in your own kitchen, and it could not be easier, so I hope that you're inspired to give it a try yourself. Mm, until next time. <laughs>